This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Good morning. It is Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio. It's August. And how are you this morning, Carol? Malcolm, I'm doing really fine. How about yourself? Life is good. Life is good. What have you been cooking? And I know you've been on the internet promoting and carrying on deep conversations about cooking and coping. Oh, I have. I've been um, I've been coping a lot this weekend, but I have engaged with our friends on our cooking and coping Facebook site. And for those who are not members, please go to Facebook and put in cooking and coping, gathering around the virtual table. We are we have about twenty four hundred members out there, either reading what people are cooking or cooking and talking about it. And um, this weekend, it was kind of full of peach dishes, some peach galette, peach and ice cream. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, tis the season. Yeah. I think it's the South Carolina and Georgia peaches that are in here now. I think the Mississippi peaches have already peaked. Um, What are you seeing? Yeah, well, there's a great, uh, great conversations. You know, our uh, Duke's Mayo winner, uh, Charlie Reeves, uh, posted pictures uh, uh, from the weekend. You know, he was the one who won the the gift bag from the from the Duke's Mayo contest that, took, that you created. <laughs> he took a picture of all of the swag. Everybody was jealous, especially the uh, great T-shirt. No doubt. So, you know, we've, we've had a great weekend. Kara baked uh, an apple cake, which I believe is one of Sally Killebrew's recipes for this apple cake. I roasted a giant uh, pan of mixed uh, peppers and eggplants, which is something I've been doing a lot of because David Patterson and his spectacular garden continue to uh, rain uh, on me joyfully. And so I always have all these peppers that David brings me. I, I have this So I take jalapenos, uh, banana peppers, uh, poblanos, and I just chop them all up and and take the eggplant and uh, cut the skin off, chop it all up, put olive oil, salt, pepper, whatever other sort of dry seasonings you like, and just roast it in the oven. And it makes a beautiful side dish, a a beautiful omelet uh, ingredient, a beautiful uh, topping for meat. Uh, for rice, for pasta. It's just a beautiful thing to have in the refrigerator. It sounds fabulous. Um, I roasted okra this week. Ah. That's something I've seen a lot on our Facebook page. People are doing so many different things with with, uh, okra. (laughs) It's it's baked, it's boiled, (laughs) it's broiled, it's roasted and um, it's fried Indian style. I'd also yeah. fried it uh, Indian style. And, you know, the Indians are big consumers of okra have been for thousands of years. And there are many recipes. Uh, Bindi masala is one of, one of my favorites that actually stews the okra. But uh, for the, the, the fried okra Indian style can actually be used as, an appetizer, uh, just something to sit around and crunch on. But you take the okra pods and you you slit them any number of times. You know, keep, Rather than chopping them, you, you cut yeah, them long ways. You kind of keep them, you know, keep them together. But uh, and then you deep fry them and and use some really great spices on them. But I serve that with some whole flounder. Uh, that I got from John at Duke and Seafood on on Friday. And it was a beautiful thing. And I have a note here on my desk that I've just shown the two of you that says okra, uh, because I have a bag of okra in my refrigerator that I've, as soon as I get off the air, I'm going upstairs and deal with it. I'm going to make stewed okra and fire roasted tomato uh, a dish, which is a great side dish. So that's what I'm going to do with my okra. So, you know, we had a, uh, an unfortunate 
restaurant closing uh, this past week. The last Coleman's Barbecue in Mississippi, oh, no. located located in Hernando, closed up. Uh, it was a family-owned and operated place for, for many, many, many generations. And sadly, uh, they finally gave it up. There was a Coleman's in my uh, hometown of Boonville, uh, just like the one uh, in Hernando. And, uh, it, you know, Coleman's was a Memphis uh, barbecue restaurant chain that spread into North Mississippi. But sadly, we've lost the last one. Uh, and so we, we mourn the passing of the Coleman's in Her- Hernando. Uh, it's a classic uh, barbecue joint. Yeah, and we thank them for all the years of, of great barbecue all over. Was it a COVID-related closing, or was it just time? I think it was just time, and and certainly COVID with the disruption and the, uh, you know, the the lack of business, the loss of business. It's just a lot, and and I hate to say this. I love being more optimistic, but we're going to lose a lot of restaurants, family-owned, independent restaurants uh, in the coming days. But anyway, we got a caller on the phone. I believe it's Shirley calling from Clarksdale. Did I get that right, Java? No, Starkville. Starkville. Okay, sorry. Hello, Shirley. Hi, uh, and thank you guys for your program. And now I'm out for my morning walk, and you guys are making me hungry. So uh, <laughs> That's our job. <laughs> so I thought, I and I heard you talking about, uh, you know, uh, roasting uh, certain things, so... What I have been doing is uh, going back and forth between roasting and steaming uh, vegetables. And so I, I get uh, uh, beets and, um, you know, raw beets and cut them into, like, uh, fourth and uh, red onion, uh, just sort of slice it sort of big, uh, carrots, and um, uh, uh, baked, uh, I'm sorry, Irish potato. And, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and I cut that up in no chunks. And I don't use salt, uh, so mm. I use a little uh, um, ground pepper, freshly ground pepper, and um, I drizzle a little olive oil over it, and I, I tell you, it, it's a it's a great um, combination. And then sometimes for steaming, what I'll do, uh, I'll get fresh broccoli, the red onion again. For some reason, the red onion is not only more fragrant, but to me, it has a better taste than either white or yellow. Uh, uh-huh. And again, the carrots. Uh, some of this is born out of, you know, ha- wanting to use up that whole bag of carrots. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I put it in a number of things, and um, and then the potatoes again. Uh, great as either uh, a side dish or or a main dish. Um, and then my grandkids came over last week of course we were all masked up and um, my daughter you know took everybody's temperature before they came in and I I fixed mashed potatoes from real potatoes (laughs) they Mm. they just loved it because you know they were accustomed to the reconstituted stuff out of the box and I have the real thing so well, Shirley, thanks a, real- a million, uh, a, a for listening and B for calling in and, and, and for those tips on roasting root vegetables, uh, whether it's carrots, potatoes, uh, beets. And I think beets is, is, is a, a vegetable we need to talk more about. I love roasting beets uh, on the grill uh, and also cooking them in the oven the way that you're suggesting. So Shirley from Starkville, thanks so much for your uh, roasting root vegetable suggestions. Those sound delicious and healthy. Enjoy your walk. Keep that heart rate up and keep listening to MPB Think Radio. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be joined by Lisa Donovan, celebrated pastry chef and writer. 
she has recently penned and published her memoir entitled Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger. So we'll dive into her book and look at some of her the difficult aspects of working in the food industry, balancing joy and doing things uh, for love and taking care of yourself. So stay tuned for Lisa Donovan. If you want to join the conversation, you are always welcome to join us by simply dialing 1-877-MPB-RING. That is 1-877-672-7464. Or you can shoot us an email to food at mpbonline.org. Carol and I and Lisa Donovan will be right back. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit and Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. You're tuned to Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio. Put your hand on the radio and don't touch that dial. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning. Good morning, Carol. How are we doing? I'm doing great, Mal. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. Would you do the honors of introducing our very special guest this morning? Well, I would love to introduce Lisa Donovan. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. Thanks for having me, guys. We are we are so pleased to have you on the show. I believe it was uh, Malcolm or Java who first read about your book being published, and it was published a week ago tomorrow. That's so right. we've really been looking forward to to having you on the show early in your uh, your book tour, your virtual book tour, <laughs> or you know, or whatever. But I have to say, this is one of the most unusual books it's actually it's a it's a a memoir and just for our listeners who don't have a copy in front of them like I do it has the most striking cover um Mm. our lady of perpetual hunger I mean the the cover looks it kind of it reminds you of a of a church and a be- I mean, a, a beautiful, wonderful, holy place. It, well, it, good. That, that's a, well, no, that, uh, you know, that was a, a shot by a really good friend of mine, Eva Saad. And um, that is the kitchen of an artist in Nashville named Buddy Jackson. And uh, he let us use his kitchen because it was uh, the site of an original photo that um, Penguin Press had fallen in love with that we were trying to replicate from one of my earlier um, dinners that I had done about 10 years ago. And so uh, they hired Eve, who had shot the original photo, to sort of recreate it. And we were sort of trying to, not sort of, we were intentionally really trying to make sure that we were, you know, made it, making it look kind of anonymous um, and a little timeless, you know, so that you know, I think it was really important for me for readers to not feel like this was necessarily, um, I was really trying to step away from this whole weird celebrity chef thing that we've all gotten so wrapped up in and just sort of allow, give myself and the readers both permission to sort of get lost in the, in the writing and the storytelling instead of sort of this idea of celebrity. So she nailed it. She did a great job. She did a really great job. Well, well, it's, it's beautiful. And just, you know, reading some of the blurbs, uh, people have written about the book, it, you know, you call it a, or it has been called a searing, beautiful, and searching chronicle of reclaiming her own story and the narrative of the women who came before her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I was really fortunate to have a lot of really great people and writers uh, come ready to sort of talk about this book and read it before we published it. And um You know, it was really important for me to, uh, you know, try to tell a bigger uh, narrative arc than just sort of being a chef in a kitchen. And I was really, you know, I was really trying to answer some questions for myself. Um, And Penguin Press gave me a lot of room to do that. So there's a lot of hopefully useful content for 
not just, you know, women, but for men to also sort of understand the, the experience of women in the world. And um, I'm just, well, I'll be, I'll be grateful for a long time that Penguin Press gave me a space to start telling stories for women that, you know, usually don't get a whole lot of space to be written. So, Well, speaking of storytelling and your beautiful book, would you mind reading uh a piece oh, from the sure. book to sort of set the stage for us. This yeah, morning. I've tried to edit it for our space. So it's a little edited from the book, but um, basically just to <clears throat> kind of set you guys up, you know, I kind of go back at some point in the book uh, to talk about uh, my experience in my, you know, first restaurant, which was a place called Trade Winds, which uh, was a, a little trailer in Valparaiso, Florida, that served the best uh, Italian food um, that you could probably find. <laughs> Definitely, you know, in the South in 1994 to you know, 2000. And uh, I had just made plans. I had already graduated high school and I had just made plans to get out of town. I was living in this really small town and it was time, it was way overdue time for me to go. And, um, uh, part of the part of the vein of this story is that I'm in a not so great relationship um, with a person that I'm also sort of fleeing. Um, it's it's a pretty monumentally bad relationship, and uh, I'm sort of planning my escape. And as I'm at work at this place called Tradewinds, I uh, get a phone call. So I'm going to read you that really quickly, and it comes from uh, chapter three, called uh, "A Pivot Wine." I started whisking the whipped cream. Took two quarts by hand with a whisk the size of my arm, long strokes at first, then shorter, then longer strokes, then shorter. I had strong arms and wrists, and the whisking took very little time back then. It was a small thing, but I made pretty whipped cream, the kind that is soft but firm, lactic and not too sweet, with just a little bit of vanilla bean peppered throughout. I was in the zone, a little cream splattered on my glasses, absorbed in the motions, when I felt Tom next to me where Sam had just been ten minutes earlier. Hey, listen, your mom is on the office phone. She sounds upset. Do you want to take it? I appreciated Tom's forever understanding that no one had to deal in other people's shit unless they wanted to. I liked that he had given me a choice. Did I want to manage my mom right then and there? I had options, according to Tom. Options and choice felt like such a novelty to me, but it honestly suited me just fine in the moment. Do you want to take it? Made me feel like a grown-up. But of course I wanted to take it. It was my mother after all. I didn't feel like much I didn't feel much like a grown-up anyway. I said, Yeah, of course. Hold the line for me. I'll be back in a minute. I wiped the cream from my hands, handed the whisk to Sam, knowing he was gonna overbeat it without even meaning to, and cleaned my glasses with my shirt as I walked back to the office. The phone was an off-white, wall-mounted rotary deal with a very long cord so that Tom could walk around the office and take inventory while he talked long distance with the wine distributors. I turned the corner, grabbed the receiver, which was teetering on top of the dial pad. My mom did sound distressed, but not at all in the way I had imagined or was accustomed to. I could tell somehow, even over the phone, that she was flushed, stammering over her greeting to me. Not sure if she could be as emotive, whatever emotion she was feeling as she wanted to be. My mother is seldom measured, yet here she was, asking me to sit down. Mom, are you okay? Is dad okay? What's going on? I don't have time to sit down. And then she giggled. She actually giggled. Mom, I'm at work. I was not amused, and at this point, Tom had sat back down at the at his desk about 10 feet from the phone. I know, I know, I know, I know, she said really fast. I just don't know where to start. Well, start somewhere, I said, mostly for Tom's benefit. He cared very little that I was on the phone, but cared totally that I was in his space. Dr. Spellman called with your physical results, she literally shouted, more nervous than I'd ever heard her before. Tom poured me a very full glass of wine and walked out of the office with a laugh. Okay, here it is. I'm putting you on speakerphone. The tape started to play, and it was, indeed, Dr. Spellman. Hello, Lisa, just calling to let you know the results of your physical are tip-top. You're as healthy as they come, no surprises there. And also to say congratulations. Looks like you're going to have a baby. Let's get you in for some prenatal care. Click. My mom pushed the answering machine. That click lingered in the air like a goddamn Zeppelin that had just exploded. You there, Lisa? You still there? 
I was, but I had slid down the wall, my back pressed up against it for stability, and was instantly splayed out on the floor with an overglass, overfull glass of wine between my legs and a 20-foot phone cord dangling from above like a noose. The light seemed dimmer. My mouth was dry. I couldn't really find my way out of the shock enough to make words. Lisa, hello. This is okay. We're okay. You're going to be okay, my mother said as softly as she could, but still with an air of excitement in her voice that I was not ready for. Mom, okay, yes, I have to go. I'm okay. We'll talk when I get off work. I stood up, hung up the phone, and felt my face and eyes burn with emotion the way they can only when your body feels pure terror. Before I realized what was going on in the room around me, I felt Tom's hand on my back. I turned around and he knew. He always knew everything, which saved me from having to say more than I wanted. I had no more defenses. I had no more resolve. I fell into his chest, went completely limp, and cried. I cried about 20 years worth of hot, fierce tears. Most of them accumulated over the last four or five. I was angry. I was scared. In an instant, I was back to square one. Tom held me up and did not say a single unnecessary word. He pulled me off his chest, kissed me on my wet cheek, and said, you ready to get back to work? Because that's what he knew I needed. I handed him back the glass of wine, went out front, and tied on my apron, not knowing then that tucking myself behind that soft canvas and tying those strings double-wrapped around my waist would be the thing that would save me time and time again for the rest of my life. Service was starting. It was time to go. And that's Lisa Donovan reading from her new memoir, Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger, which is a, uh, a very tender book uh, of affirmation and resilience. <clears throat> and I know that when you got to do something not all writers get to do, and that is you got to read your own audio book. I did, which, yeah. which had to have been very interesting, reading your own story into it a microphone. Well, you know, it was it was good timing um, because, you know, you go through, you know, writing a book is obviously years of work. And you kind of go through these phases where you don't want to look at it ever again. You know, and right. we, had gone, <laughs> we had gone through the copy, copy editing phase. And um, I had this really nice little like, you know, eight week break where I could legitimately not look at the book for a while before we started audio recording. And it was just the right amount of time for me to you know, have done all of the heavy work with the copy editing, which is one of my favorite parts of writing a book. I, I now know it's a really great technically, it really appeals to the chef side of my brain. It's this really beautiful technical side of writing. And, um, and you know, you get really deep into sort of the, the mechanics of the entire book, and then you need to walk away. And so the audio book recording, that was really the first time that I got to uh, distill the book as a reader. Uh, when you were you were talking about the experience at at uh, Tradewinds, and it it made me think about your time in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Even before that, you were a waitress when you were a young teen, mm-hmm. and so most of your career in the kitchen until you were in your mid twenties was in the front of the house. That's right. Yeah. Even yeah. though you were whipping cream, I mean, mm-hmm. you were technically um, a waiter. That's right. I've, yeah, most of my, uh, you know, the first half of my experiences in a kitchen were as a server. And the reason I was uh, making in that particular scene whipped cream is because we would do family meals. So all restaurants have, you know, which I think most people, it's common knowledge now, but restaurants, you know, we all try to eat together either before, but typically after service. And so I was making whipped cream to go with some strawberry shortcakes that me and the dishwasher, Sam, who had a nickname one eyed Sam, who was a dear friend of mine, we always made strawberry shortcake together. And so, um, in that particular scene, I was only cooking, um, because I was making some family meal dessert, but yes, I was a server in that restaurant and that's how I started, um, but I always, you know, would get back into the kitchen and play around. And Tom, my boss, who is like a, you know, you know, I'm very close to my father, so I don't need like a surrogate father figure. But um, he was uh, very much this sort of mentor father figure to me. And, um, you know, he basically kind of let me have the run of the place. So if I wanted to practice baking or making bread, he would let me throw some in the oven. And, um, you know, it was it was all of our home, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and then you were a server at a very fine restaurant, uh, Margot mm-hmm. Cafe in 
Nashville. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, your back of the house and front of the house converged. You're you're baking at home. Mm -hmm. So how did that transition occur from your work life to your your home passion? Well, so I was running, a, basically, I was running a little uh, bakery business, you know, under the table bakery business that, you know, uh, probably was not legal in any capacity out of uh, my apartment. And when the kids were younger, because I, you know, also while I was a cocktail waitress at, uh, you know, a restaurant near Vanderbilt and, um, and, you know, it gave us a lot of extra money, well, uh, some extra money every week that we could buy groceries. And so it kind of created this clientele um, with, you know, over the span of a couple of years. And by the time I started waiting tables at um, Marco, um, I had a clientele list that, you know, was starting to make regular orders. And Margo had agreed that they could come and pick up, you know, my pastries at her restaurant between certain hours before she opened. And there was, I was a wait, you know, I was a server with uh, a woman named Ann Kostrowski, who was a uh, Culinary Institute um, trained pastry chef who had just moved here uh, from Northern California and was gifted beyond belief, but worked front of house because you make more money um, front of house than you do in a kitchen. And so uh, she was actually one of the original chef owners of City House, which is where I had my first actual job as a pastry chef. And she started to see these things that I was bringing in that people were, um, you know, picking up and she her piqued her curiosity and she opened, she made herself available to me, uh, as a self-taught person to, you know, talk to my, she was the first professional pastry chef I ever knew. And so, um, it became this, uh, not only was she the first opportunity I had when she, um, went, you know, when she went to uh, be the pastry chef and open city house with her then husband at the time. Um, but she also wanted to talk about baking and she was one of the first people that I ever met that wanted to talk about baking in that way. And up until that point, it just felt like, um, you know, sort of an odd curiosity that I had and like a very private passion and something that I did because it could get us a couple of extra bucks when the kids were little. So, uh, you know, and then it's just sort of the magic of how things happen. You, you, you seem to bump into the right people when you need them, if you're paying close enough attention. So I felt very lucky that we were crossing paths the way that we were. So. All right, Lisa, it is time for us to take a break. We'll be right back. Please stand by. We are happy to have you on the show. Lisa Donovan, uh, Pastry, celebrity, celebrity, uncelebrity pastry chef. <laughs> also, a uh, uh, James Beard award winning food writer and now author of a new memoir, Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger. I believe Lisa grew up in Niceville, Florida, but now she lives in Nashville, Tennessee. When we come back, we will talk to her about what it's like to be a woman in a male dominated world of the American kitchen. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. Tune to Deep South Dining on MPB Think Radio. I'm Malcolm White with Carol Puckett, and we are delighted to have our special guest, Nashville-based pastry chef, food writer, James Beard Award winner, and now uh, author of a memoir, Lisa Donovan. Welcome back, Lisa. Hey, thanks for having me again. You know, you're not supposed to do this, but when I was reading your book, it reminded me of another book, and I was just curious if you ever read it. And and this is a shout out to the book for you and anyone else who's listening. There's a great book by Amy, Amy Bender called The Particular Sadness of Lemon Cake. Have you ever heard of such a book? Oh, um, I have. You know what? I have been so wrapped up in you know my own writing. I have not had a whole lot of time to read it, and it's definitely on my list. It sounds like a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book, but yours is a beautiful book as Thank well, you. though painful in parts. You know, you, mm-hmm. you've been very honest about 
your life struggle and put it all out there. And mm. I think that's very brave and uh, commendable. Thanks. Um, part of your book, one of the biggest themes of your book is how difficult it is for women in the male dominated world of the American kitchen. And we had Sean Brock on the show a few months ago, and in his latest book, he uses the analogy to talk about the culture of the kitchen, that it's like a pirate ship. And, you know, with all these, you know, crazy characters and this crazy culture, and where do women fit in on a pirate ship? Mm. Well, you know, I think the bigger overall conversation, you know, yes, it's hard for women, but I also think the restaurant industry is is hard for a lot of people, you know, um, and that does, doesn't mean I don't want to have the conversation about, you know, the difficulty it, it is for women. I think the bigger conversation is actually uh, more about sort of... <clears throat> the workforce and the, you know, the people that were now, you know, that the general public and the government and, and I think the investors are now realizing are considered essential workers in our, in our communities. And, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's worth sort of talking about, um, just, you know, the working class and the labor force of this country and how so often, especially in an industry like the restaurant industry where the margins are, you know, so thin, especially whenever you have, um, you know, very wealthy investors pouring so much money into the the build out and the front end of the restaurant, and they save so little for the people who are actually creating uh, and generating the <laughs> the product that's making them money. And these people so often get, you know, uh, they're considered an afterthought in the greater scheme of the financial infrastructure of a of a thing like a restaurant. And you know, there are a lot of chefs out there that are really trying to sort of do this really good work do, and doing it the right way. And, um, you know, in particular, it feels like a really important time to sort of to, to sort of pay attention to the chefs that have been dedicated uh, in their careers and in their growth uh, to their workforce. And that includes their dishwashers. That includes their porters. That includes everyone that keeps these restaurants and this, you know, this industry, um, such a, such an important part of our communities and cultures. And, um, you know, I think right now my hope in this moment is that, um, we can support them the best way that we possibly can. You know, um, when I wrote this book, I did want to address some things about wage disparity for, you know, the, uh, how hard it is to try to have a, um, uh, sustainable and stable life as a woman who was raising two kids, um, in the restaurant industry and, and why that's so difficult. Um, uh, you know, I hope, I hope I, I hope I touched on that a lot, but really what I wanted to address mostly was uh, an urgency to uh, encourage these high dollar investors to really prioritize their workforce better and, um, you know, more sustainably. So besides being a celebrated baker, author, and traveling uh, chef, you're also a wife and a mother. I would be curious to know what goes on in the kitchen at the Donovan family. <laughs> uh, well, last night we made, I think I made my best, uh, my uncle Bob, who's uh, from the Bronx, Italian, calls it gravy, as we all know most Italians do. I feel, dis <laughs> I feel disingenuous calling it gravy because I'm not Italian, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nod to my uncle Bob right now and call it gravy. I made the best meatballs and gravy I've ever made. I think he would have been really proud of me. Uh, we we made a great sauce last night. I made a, a really great little chocolate cake, and you know, I mean, we do a lot of really simple things. I'm, I love you know, I love cooking simple things, but I also pay attention, like any good cook, uh, to my ingredients, and I try to just get the best uh, product that I possibly can. We don't actually eat a whole lot of meat in this house, but. Um, you know, I really believe in supporting my local farmers. And there's a, actually a, a, you know, I wouldn't consider it an industrial farm, but Nyman Ranch, um, which is out west, uh, is a really important farm that I think, um, you know, it's one of the larger 
more, uh, you know, I, I, again, I hesitate to use the word industrial because it's not, um, it's not factory farming even in the slightest, but they are a bigger scale farm. Um, and they're one of the only large scale farms I'll buy meat from, and it's just delicious. And, and so yeah, it, they're, and they're pretty accessible as well. So you can find them, you know, across the Southeast if you're looking. Um, yeah, we made meatballs and gravy last night. It was delicious and a little chocolate cake and, you know, we don't do anything too fancy. And I do, you know, I'm, I'm surprised by how little I I've um, wanted to bake over this uh, lockdown. It's really been interesting. I haven't felt the urge uh, to get in the kitchen as much as I think I would have imagined if I had ever been forced to stay home for six months. (laughs) It's just really, you know, I have very little interest in, you know, my, uh, my, my drive to get in the kitchen and make really crazy meals is, uh, you know, is, is something I have to sort of go, okay, well, I've got all of these vegetables. That's another thing we do in the summer is we, you know, very frequently we'll have just an all vegetable, you know, you guys are all Southern, you know, that there's a couple, there's, there's several months out of the year where you can just make a whole meal out of all your farmer's market vegetables. And so some nights we'll just have, you know, a bunch of roasted okra and some boiled corn and, you know, maybe a little pan of cornbread and some, you know, whatever, whatever it is that we picked up at the market that week. So. Well, that sounds delicious, but I think probably one of the reasons you haven't been baking is everybody else in the United States <laughs> has <laughs> been. Just, you see all these, uh, these pictures of, of unlikely people making sourdough bread and learning to uh-huh. make pastry. And for the first couple of months during the quarantine, I mean, it was almost impossible to get flour. Yeah, and it was. Yes. It really, and, I can remember. Know, I, I couldn't believe I had to mail order, uh-huh. uh, mail order flour. I can but, remember my mom called me from uh, Northwest Florida where they live. And she was like, do you have any idea where I can find some yeast? And I looked and I have a bunch of, you know, secret chef resources. And I looked at all of them. And unless she wanted like a flat of yeast, I couldn't find her any. So yeah, it was pretty crazy. I mean, I never thought of ordering yeast on amazon.com but right that's what I did (laughs) but Lisa people describe your desserts as being quote traditional and you're you're known as being a southern baker and what do those terms mean to you and um, how how did your style develop over the years Mm. Uh, you know, and I touch on a little bit of this in the book where, you know, I, I had to sort of reconcile, you know, I actually grew up in Germany. My dad was in the army, my, the army. And uh, I, you know, because I, I kind of grew up back and forth between Germany and southern Georgia until, you know, I didn't move to Niceville until I was uh, about 17 years old. And so, you know, I spent most of my teens, we moved back to the States when I was almost 15. And I spent my teens sort of trying to figure out what the South was. Because when you don't grow up here, but you are of Southern people, it sort of is familiar. But also you uh, you kind of get into these cultural deep dives where you have to learn very quickly, like where you come from. And so a lot of my uh, discovery of being uh, Southern also came through baking. And Um, you know, and also the restaurants and the chefs that I worked alongside informed that as well, you know, like, um, at City House, whenever we opened it, you know, we did a lot of Italian influenced things, but always with our ingredients. And so we would have a bunch of buttermilk and pecans instead of things that you would traditionally find in Italy. And so, you know, I would make, you know, riffs on, uh, Italian, traditional Italian desserts, but using Southern ingredients. And so there is something sort of happened there. And then once I left City House, you know, I'd started doing the buttermilk road Sunday suppers, which were remarkably Southern, which were sort of my like, let's just get saturated in pickling and, you know, high Southern vegetable seasons and, you know, figuring out how to write a menu that is just wholly about, um, you know, traditional Southern cuisine, whatever that meant for that menu. And, you know, and sometimes I did a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, Central and, you know, Central American style food. And my grandmother, you know, made these beautiful tortillas. And so I would make dishes that could go with her tortillas and things like that. And 
Um, and then once, of course, I, I started working at Husk and with Sean at, you know, the, the Southern, um, the Southern, uh, it's like Southern on steroids, you know, so like everything, <laughs> everything was just like, we could only have ingredients that were immediately in the hundred mile radius of where we were. And, um, and it really became this very deep exploration of, um, Southern food ways. And uh, that was really important, you know, for me. And, and also, you know, whenever I sort of took, I, I'm self-taught, but I'm self-taught um, in French technique, which was a really interesting combination. And so I really started to enjoy finding these really old, um, very home style recipes and using a lot of French t technique to sort of, um, I hate the word elevate because it suggests that they're not good the other way, but sort of to, you know, create a structure that's a little bit more elevated for a restaurant you know a, a pie crust that will really really you know deserve to be on a plate after a five course meal you know and so I really started to take this French technique that I had taught myself and really tried to hone in on uh, and apply it to these you know to a buttermilk chest pie or you know a chocolate layer cake and um, and so that was really fun for me to really try to um bring this Southern tradition of desserts into a different conversation that is really celebrating its technical prowess. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to take our last break of the hour. Lisa, stick around if you wouldn't mind. Lisa Donovan is our guest. Her new memoir, Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger. When we come back, we will continue to talk to Lisa and maybe get a few baking tips <clears throat> from her. So stay tuned for that. If you want to join the conversation, or talk to Lisa, ask her a question, 1-877-MPB-RING, 1-877-672-7464. Lisa, Carol, and I will be back right after this short break. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. You tune to Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio. Malcolm White with Carol Puckett and our very special guest today, renowned pastry chef and author and James Beard Award winning journalist, Lisa Donovan. Welcome back, Lisa. Hey there. Here's one of your old Southern degrees of separation. When you were at Husk, my youngest brother delivered meat to you guys from Bear Creek Farms. Oh, I love Bear Creek Farms. <laughs> They're the best. We probably met. <laughs> yeah, you probably met old Brad White when he would drop off the meat. Probably. I was usually the earliest one there, so if uh, and I would sign a bunch of stuff in in the morning, so it's very good. Very likely we cross paths. <laughs> well, being being in the restaurant kitchen early is one of the real marks of a pastry chef. Oh, it's one and, of the best. It's yeah. one of the best parts of being a pastry chef. <laughs> and it also, you know, appeals more more to women. I think that's uh, yeah because you you're in early by yourself. You can yeah, get mm. out before the hustle and bustle of, of everything. So kind of take us through an early morning in a restaurant kitchen for a pastry chef. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting. I think it appeals to a certain person rather than a certain gender. I had a lot of young men who enjoyed coming in in the mornings. And uh, I think it's a, I think there's a really particular kind of person that gets drawn to pastry where they are a little bit obviously more fastidious and introverted than um maybe a typical line cook chef or a savory chef. Um, we like a system. We like a, we like a, we like a prep sheet. We like a, you know, a real dedicated sort of uh, pathway to success that we kind of create an infrastructure for ourselves. And so I think that morning time, you know, we kind of get in, in that time when um, it's quiet and everything is, 
you know, uh, sort of crisp and clean from the night before and you can, you know, walk around and get your fruit delivered and, um, you know, sit at your station and clean and process fruit for a couple of hours while you drink your coffee and get ready for the day. And, uh, in, in restaurants in particular that only do dinner service, it's really a treat. Whenever you have a restaurant that does a lunch service, it's a little bit more high, uh, high intensity and high stress because, you know, you've got, you know, the line cooks will start rolling in at, you know, nine and 10 instead of, you know, noon and one at restaurants, wherever you're only doing dinner service, it's a real treat because usually you don't get infiltrated by the other cooks until later in the <laughs> afternoon. So you have this really nice swatch of time between whenever you come in in the morning and usually around lunchtime. So, uh, it's, you know, not to say that I don't like being around other cooks, but I really also very much enjoy being alone, especially in a kitchen. <laughs> well, you talk about being attracted to fruit, uh, mm. and you particularly uh, seem to enjoy preparing yeah. desserts with fruits. Can you name a few of your favorite desserts and maybe give our listeners some tips about preparing those? Okay. Sure. I mean, obviously, we get beautiful peaches, you know, several months out of the year. But I'll tell you what, I think one of the most exciting times in the year for me is that really uh, small window of time, uh, two times in, uh, every year. There's one small window of time. Uh, in the September to October um, period of time where we get really beautiful, we start to start seeing some really pretty stone fruits like damps and plums that come uh, from different places, not usually from Tennessee, but, you know, we'll start getting them from from down below. Uh, and then and then that winter time, this is my favorite time because you know, we're not like California where we just have sort of like a year round, uh, right. you know, bounty of amazing apricots all of the time and 20 different varieties. Um, but there's a window of time, which you guys are probably also very familiar with because you're so close proximity, um, usually December and January and sometimes February, if you're lucky, where you get that really beautiful Louisiana citrus. And oh, it's yeah. really so incredible to have the winter citrus come up from Louisiana, because at that point, you're using a lot of vegetables to bake. You know, you're, you're, you've done everything you possibly can with a sweet potato, you know, you're like, and more sweet potato pie. And how about a sweet potato pie? <laughs> and, you know, you start to sort of get a little, you can get creative as you want with sort of these roots and things. Um, and, you know, that's right around when I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, when pop Pawpaws would pop out, and you know I'm not a huge fan of a pawpaw, and I know that's sacrilegious in the in the South, but um, but that that moment, uh, you know, when we get those beautiful grapefruits and caracaras and or all of these beautiful oranges from Louisiana from December, January, and February, and then as soon as you sort of get, you know, and they they aren't as remarkable as they were in December and January at the end of January, beginning of February. That's right when you start getting those really incredible. Louisiana strawberries. strawberries yeah so it's incredible like that phase right there I know like we have the beautiful things happening in the summer but that moment in the year is one of my favorite times that's a beautiful transition to go from all of this citrus to strawberries and it's one of my favorite times in the kitchen because you know, you we, know it's we actually make pilgrimages down yeah. my way towards you or because you have sellers along the highway yeah you, you know buy satsumas in the winter and oh, then yeah. you know, the strawberry season is it's a big deal it's it's certainly worth celebrating it really is. And, you know, and with that, you know, you can spend all of those months just, you know, using them fresh, freezing, freezing the juice for later. You know, if you can, if you can buy, you know, the, the real trick in that moment of having those beautiful satsumas available and those beautiful caracaras available and the beautiful grapefruit available is that you can make a lot of marmalade. And I think that's a really great idea. And that's what a lot of people do. Um, but don't forget about the juice. You can juice and freeze it. And you can use that in desserts uh, in the future as well, because that juice, you know, can be added to things. You can make a really beautiful, um, I mean, you could make all kinds of things. The list is huge and long. I mean, uh, but I think everyone sort of falls back on, on, on putting them up and making preserves, which is a great idea. But you can also, you can also, you know, peel and make candied you know, candied um, rinds and things like that that'll keep for a while. So. 
Well, Lisa, we certainly appreciate you joining us today. We wish you all the best, uh, not so only much. in your professional culinary career, but in your writing career. And good luck with the new book, Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger. Really tell people, tell our listeners where they can reach you on social media and other Oh, gosh. Um, I am on, uh, I think on Instagram, I'm Lisa Marie Donovan. And on the Twitters, if you do that, I think I'm still Buttermilk Road. Um, and I think that's really it. Well, thanks again for joining us. Best of luck. And we'll talk to Thank you, you soon. Thank you, guys. Thanks yes, for having indeed. me. Deep Take South care. Dining is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio. It is funded by generous contributions from folks just like you. Our show is produced by Java Chapman. Our guest today was Lisa Donovan, co-host Carol Puckett, and I certainly appreciate your time today. Now stay tuned for Now You're Talking with Marshall Ramsey. His special guest today is Robert St. John. That is followed by Southern Remedy at 11 a.m. So join us every Monday, 9 o'clock, for Deep South Dining right here on MPB Think Radio.